Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Kevin Allen from Sandia National Labs, and uh, I've been working in cybersecurity for a number of years now. I was fortunate enough to get started in it by accident uh, when I uh, first uh, became an officer in the uh, U.S. Army in their early 90s, and I had a computer science uh, degree, uh, and I was kind of selected to head up a new unit there. And then uh, after my tour in the Army, I started working at Sandia, and I wanted to get more into the, the research aspects of it and started doing incident response, and now I'm doing more research, working with students and, and stuff. So it kind of gives you a, a quick uh, once over the world of uh, my background. There we go. Okay, being an Army guy, I figured I had to throw something Army in there. <laughs> so uh, if you, uh, one of the things I'm going to be talking about uh, today is the use of deception uh, in cybersecurity. So uh, we all think of uh, deception as being uh, the upper hand being given to the attackers, right? The attackers have been using deception uh, from the very beginning, right? So they use a lot of social engineering techniques. So we see them, you know, sending out emails uh, called spear phishing emails. Uh, typically, they'll have a link to a malicious site, or they'll contain an infected Word document. They'll contain uh, an infected PDF file. All right. So all that. What is that? That's deception, right? Uh, well, there's one little aspect of deception that I'm going to focus in on today on a project. I'll tell you about a project that we're running right now, an experiment for a, a, a DoD customer. And it's kind of uh, capitalizing on using deception and camouflage from a cybersecurity defense standpoint instead of a cyber attacker standpoint. Okay? So this picture uh, is relevant because does anyone recognize what tank that is? Yeah, all right, it's a Sherman. Okay, so anyone uh, up in our age range would probably <laughs> at least remember pictures of it, you know, uh, for you uh, young folks. Uh, you know, we have a, the M1 Abrams now, right? That's replaced uh, a series of tanks since then. Well, is that a real tank? All right, thank you. That is an inflatable that was used uh, during World War II. Uh, it was, uh, you can look it up on uh, Wikipedia, it was uh, part of, uh, of a unit the Army called the Ghost Army. And there was a whole number of soldiers that they recruited and drafted into the Army during World War II, particularly to maintain this Ghost Army. And that was in preparation for the invasion of Europe, right, in France. And so we all, you know, have read about and seen, you know, good PBS shows, I'm sure, about how we created this whole deception operation to make the Germans think that we were coming in at another place in France, right? They all knew the invasion was coming. There was no way to deceive them of that. Uh, the only thing that we could see them was the possible day and location, right? So we created this entire ghost army, and that's an inflatable. They literally had hundreds, if not thousands, of tanks and jeeps and cannons and so on. They created uh, an entire uh, unit of fake soldiers, right? And they literally created their own radio control signals and everything. And they guess who they recruited to do this? It was a lot of like a non... Um, you know, typical uh, soldiers that they were uh, recruiting, like they're, they're recruit, you know, for infantry, they're looking for, you know, that 18 to 21 year old that wants to, you know, fire a rifle. Well, they went to New York and Philadelphia, went to Madison Avenue, they recruited advertising folks, they recruited artists, they recruited salesmen, right? They knew people who like to deceive others, right? I always like to call salesmen <laughs> the, the greatest criminals ever, right? <laughs> right? All they do is deceive you. Right, you go to the car lot. I just went to a car lot a few weeks ago, and I felt like you know, okay, I, I've been doing this you know for years and years, and don't they know that I'm on to them? No, you still have to go to them, you know, and you still have to play the game, right? So, uh, so anyway, this is uh, I thought it was a really good picture I found on Wikipedia to kind of introduce this subject of uh, camouflage and cyber. So, uh, let's see here, okay. So now that you have an idea of what you know, the camouflage is about, hide or disguise the presence 
of something, right? Make it blend in with their surroundings. And that's what they did in World War II. Okay, how do we apply that to cyber now? Uh, okay, there's uh, a number of different ways. Uh, we first started uh, a number of years back, which kind of got me interested uh, in the whole uh, field of cyber security. If, uh, if you remember, and some of you may have read it, there's a book by, um, let's see, Bill Cheswick and Stephen uh, Bellavin, who worked at Bell Labs in the 80s and 90s, and they wrote a book, I think it was in the early 90s, uh, called um, uh, Inter Security in Internet Firewalls, Repelling the Wily Hacker. And if you haven't read that, I highly recommend get on Amazon, purchase a copy. Uh, there may even be some free legitimate copies out there, uh, or illegitimate, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> ever since they shut down Pirate Bay, you know, what do students do? I don't know. <laughs> Go to Pirate Bay. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, there, that's a really good book. It talks, he's got a whole story in there uh, about Burford. Uh, so what uh, Bill Cheswick did was uh, he created a, uh, he, he knew that one of his uh, machines was possibly under attack. I think it was a mail server. He created a fake user account called Burford, right? He just made it up, put it into the password file, right? And this is a typical, you know, operation we would use in intelligence, right? We create things that are fake and we think somebody is leaking secrets to the enemy. So we start to pass this individual, you know, these fake secrets. Well, that's what uh, this Burford user account was because there is no user Burford. Uh, you know, Bill created it. Uh, and that's how he got started, and there's a really good story. I think you can find the paper about how he uh, deceived uh, this hacker, and he actually followed along this hacker for days and weeks and planting things. As the hacker got further in to the machine, he would plant more things, fake documents and everything. And there's another really good story about the uh, different scientists at Berkeley that was almost did the same kind of thing, and it turned out to be a, uh, a Russian, not Russian, but German, East German hacking uh, group uh, back before Germany split up, and it's a book uh, called Cuckoo's Egg. And uh, if you haven't read that, highly, highly recommend. These are these are two books that you know will really get you motivated and really spun up and really enjoy. Uh, what cybersecurity is all about. And they're not technical at all, so uh, they go into the details, but they describe it at a level that is not going to, you know, bore you to tears, okay? So I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, motivation there to get, get into this whole field. Because cyber defense, we really, you know, need to think about different ways that attackers use Right? Instead of just always playing the good guy, uh, we should basically play like uh, we were talking about, the white hat or gray hat, you know? So honeypots, okay. So Chris talked about honeypots yesterday, right? Uh, which I thought was an extremely interesting talk. And uh, honeypots have been around, I think the, it was about the same time in the early 90s when uh, Bill Cheswick was doing this. Uh, some other folks were coming up with the idea, oh, they would read Bill's paper and say, why don't we, instead of just creating a fake user account, create a whole fake server, you know, and put it out there, and then we can observe the hackers and see what they do and, you know, lure them in, right? So basically play their game against them. Okay, so honeypots kind of came into favor in the, in the 90s. They uh, kind of fell out of favor. Uh, probably about 10 years ago. And the reason is that there, it's really, we, as the attackers got better and better, uh, we learned that it was harder and harder to create and maintain these honeypots and to make them look realistic enough that the attackers would then stay, you know, be fooled by it and continue their attacks so we could study them, right? And so I've been doing this for a number of years and I started off when the attacks were really, uh, you know, targeting network services, right? So mail servers and web servers and so on. And now it's at the point where all that's been kind of fairly well protected, at least put behind, you know, uh, a series of firewalls and other types of uh, defensive uh, devices. Now it's generally a social engineering attack that gets you into the door, right? So it's generally through email, through web, uh, you know, you got spear phishing, you got, uh, you know, drive-bys, what they call, is where someone goes to a website that's infected 
and uh, they pick up something malicious on that website, right? That infects the browser. From the browser, the brow uh, they get another piece of malware that infects the operating system. So they go from the application layer to the operating system. Sometimes they can go from the operating system even to the hardware, the firmware, the BIOS, or what's called the UEFI now, right? And it's really hard to get them out. If they're in your hardware layer, I don't care how many times you wipe your hard drive, reinstall your OS, reinstall your application, put your data back on there, they will still be there. And that's what we're at now, right? We've progressed over these uh, past several decades. And so the honeypots are generally, it was really good back in the day when they were attacking network services. We could put a mail server up, a web server, and they were gonna attack it and we could study them and stuff. Well, I spent a several years running a honeypot at Sandia outside of our main uh, business network on a, on a DMZ portion, and we found out it was just a waste of time. It was a lot of maintenance, a lot of time, and uh, all we got was some script kitties, we got some maybe you know, botnets knocking at our door and uh, found out it was just, you know, we weren't learning anything and it was taking way too much time, so we shut it down. Uh, so basically, the disadvantages you see there, they're, they're really hard to create, you know, realistic, authentic uh, honeypots. They have a narrow field of view because you're setting up separate machines and servers to just act as a honeypot. You want it to be outside of your normal business network, right? Because you don't want to give them ready access to your business network, thereby increasing the risk to your own organization, right? So uh, that's hard to explain to the CIO why you set up this honeypot and let these guys in so you can study and then they attack the entire network and now the, the uh, Sandia is subject to ransomware, right? That's not a, not a good uh, place to be in when you have to talk to the CIO. All right, so some of the other things that have branched out since then then, uh, is, uh, so uh, I don't know if you've heard of Canary Traps, but there was a recent movie that I thought was really cool with Brad Pitt, and it was called Allied, and they talked about the blue dye operation. And I was like, oh, I've heard of that, you know, I'm a former Intel officer. Uh, and we didn't call it blue dye, but I knew what it was. And basically it's where, just like I said before, where you create this fake information, you give it to someone you think is, a, is spying on you, and you see, because you're already collecting you know, signals intelligence, and you see if that information gets you know, uh, transmitted out to the enemy. And then if it does, you say, okay, this guy is, uh, is, is caught now. All right, so canary traps, blue dye. We can do the same thing with files, right? So one of the things uh, many years ago, worked with some FBI folks, and we had talked about doing just that, right? So placing fake files on particular machines, and then you know seeing if the hacker would come back to that machine, get the file, and see where that file would end up at. Well, how do we do that? We can place some kind of beacon in the file, right? So the attackers uh, try to lure, you know, lure us with spear phishing emails, right? Well, we can do the same thing to them, and we can place malware inside files, and then I'll beacon back to one of the machines on the internet that I monitor, okay? And all this stuff is old now. So I'm not telling you anything that's confidential anymore. <laughs> this has been done for years and years. And, uh, you know, and some people may still do it. But you know, the attackers are on to us now. So we have to get better. Uh, so, uh, so one of the things uh, we, we used to use is like digital watermarks and still do. So I'm sure everyone's heard about the recent case with Reality Winner and you know, the NSA leaker. right? Uh, how did they catch her? Did you read about the, the way they caught her? Yeah, the printer, okay. If you look at this, uh, this uh, uh, figure right down here, what are those, yellow dots, right? So on current printers now, a lot of the modern, you know, more expensive printers, uh, they generally will print out a almost invisible watermark. And these are really tiny, so I had to magnify, or whoever did this magnified it greatly. Uh, but these are really tiny, and it actually spells out a code. And the code uh, will tell you what model printer it is, who's the manufacturer, the date it was manufactured, and the serial number of the printer. All, guess, guess what? All in, in that, right? Kind of deceptive because the potential spy doesn't know about this, or at least, you know, should have known but didn't know. So obviously, if Reality Winner really wanted to be a good spy, uh, she should have learned about these techniques, right? So that was not good. Uh, this may play in her favor, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but that's how the NSA tracked her down in the FBI uh, because they were able to identify the printer 
and they said, hey, this printer is located at this NSA facility, and then they have system logs, all right? And they say, okay, well, who printed out uh, this particular document? And the reason they knew which particular document it was because the intercept, not being a very good uh, journalistic uh, organization trying to protect its sources, sent a copy of the original document to the government. <laughs> so if they really wanted to protect their sources, you, you don't send an original copy <laughs> and ask them for you know, comments. So there were so many mistakes made, so you have to wonder, was this deliberately done and it was this all set up by maybe the FBI or something? I don't know. <laughs> it, it definitely has some, I'm an in Intel guy. <laughs> I, I suspect everyone and everything, and uh, I'm just reading about this, and it makes me think this is just like that whole Sony movie hack, you know, with the North Korea, supposed North Koreans. I didn't believe a word of that, and I don't believe a word of this. <laughs> Something just doesn't smell right. Uh, <laughs> So uh, anyway, uh, so, so another thing that grew out of uh, the technologies post honeypot era is uh, moving target uh, defense. And so how many people have heard of that term? Okay, a few. Yeah, so DHS uh, and several other or organizations with, uh, within DOD have been pursuing funding, moving target defense. We've been working on it at Sandia for a number of years. Uh, it's fairly recent, I think within the last five years is what I remember anyway. And so there's a number of different uh, layers within the moving target defense kind of architecture. And I'll get into those layers so you can understand why we, what we can do with camouflage and deception and where we're currently targeting right now. Okay, so the concept behind uh, moving target is randomizing the cyber system components to reduce the likelihood of successful attacks and add a dimension of confusion within attacker's mindset, right? So that's what the attackers are doing to us, right? They try to confuse us, right? We get so many emails every day and then one of them might be a spear phishing email. Well, what does our security group do? They try to confuse us even more and send us decoy messages that are generated by uh, an appliance that is a spear phishing email to see if one of us will click on it. And then if we do, we get shamed. You know? It's like, you shouldn't have clicked on that, right? But it's not a real spear phishing one. It was just a test to see you know, if the uh, workforce is being you know, aware. So that's good awareness training. Right? But a lot of people say, well, I got 100 emails a day. I don't have time to stop and think. Right? So one of the speakers yesterday had talked about that reflex action versus reflection. All right? And so I try to reflect, and sometimes I don't always respond to emails because I think they're spare phishing emails, and especially when they come from Dr. Shea. So <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Shea says, I, I haven't heard from you. I said, well, quit spend, sending these, those spare phishing emails, and I'll talk to you. <laughs> so. So in general, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm really hard to work with, but I, I, I really enjoy my job. So <laughs> if you do get to work with me, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so the objective of this moving target is to alter the current static nature, right? So generally the attackers have the upper hand because our networks are all static, right? So we create this network, right? We create this IP address scheme. We create our routers and switches and configure them and maintain them, and it rarely ever changes, right? So the attackers can spend months, years studying how it's set up, what the defenses are, what appliances, what firewalls we have, what services are available to the internet, and what services are not, right? So obviously, they have the upper hand in this. So moving target says, hey, let's shift everything around. So the IP address has changed. Maybe the operating system's changed. That's where it gets really weird, because moving target, in general, you think, oh, it's just going to be IP address dynamic. No, you can also alter the operating systems, alter the code, right? What if you have one web server? This is wild, all right? Uh, when you have one web server, it's generally running on a Linux system, running on an Apache or Nginx, and it's uh, serving up, say, PHP code. What if you create that application now so it runs on a Windows IIS web server, uh, it's running ASP.NET instead of PHP, and then you rotate it every so many hours back and forth. That's pretty cool, huh? So now the attacker has studied that you have a Linux web server and you're running PHP and has an attack, but five minutes ago, 
that has automatically rotated to a Microsoft IES web server. His attack is not going to work now, right? How do you maintain that? It's hard. <laughs> there is, therein lies the problem, right? So we make it dynamic. We make it really hard for the attacker. Uh, and then it becomes really hard and we confuse ourselves, all right? So now <laughs> security, you know, is sort of this, you know, they always talk about security being one of these, you know, penalty things, right? It always slows things down. It makes your job harder. Uh, obviously, moving target can be a huge amplification of that whole paradigm, right? All right. So let's see if we can make it simpler. All right. So before I do that, I just wanted to, uh, Dr. Shea mentioned the kill chain this morning. It's been well documented many, many times. Uh, I'm sure everyone has at least heard of it, but I just wanted to review it. There are many different uh, names that individuals have come up with to document the kill chain model. The original one's documented by Lockheed Martin about six, seven, eight years ago. Uh, and uh, it had seven stages. Uh, this particular one that I'm referencing here has about uh, one, two, three, four, five stages. Generally, it follows a very, very similar workflow. Uh, you start off with the reconnaissance, right? Very uh, kind of evident. You're doing obviously some type of reconnaissance. It used to be you were looking for services, right? Against your victim's network. And you would launch some kind of scan, typically using a tool called Nmap, right? Nowadays, it's much more sophisticated. Now that reconnaissance is more of an intelligence operation. I'm gonna look for individuals in the targeted organization I'm going to see what they're doing, right? So very, very typical intelligence officer kind of stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to follow that person. I'm going to target an, uh, an organization and find individuals that can help me get inside that organization. So I might see what kind of conferences, right, that organization participates in. I might see uh, what are the individuals. And then look up the individuals. Hey, guess what? How, how many people here have a profile on LinkedIn? Yeah, I noticed there. The number of people uh, that I used to work with in the intelligence community has dropped off greatly on LinkedIn. So there's something now, because I know they currently work for uh, government organizations, and their LinkedIn page doesn't show anything anymore. But that was a great way to get you know, really, really easy intel on someone you know, on LinkedIn. So uh, generally, you know, if you're an attacker, you're going to try and you know, figure out who these people are. Uh, then, if I know you just recently attended, you know, say, the uh, workshop here at Norfolk State, uh, I might go ahead and generate an agenda, proposed agenda for next year's workshop, and I'm going to copy the same logo, the, uh, the PDF that you have. I'm going to make it look, and I'm going to sign it Dr. Shea. <laughs> and he's done this to me many times, so I know this happened. <laughs> I said, don't send me another malicious document. <laughs> I get to talk to the own folks, my own folks in security come and interview me on a routine basis. They're like, why are you running malware? I go, it's my job, OK? <laughs> And students, I have them run malware, and sometimes they get in trouble. So now I have a private network. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so next step in the kill chain is going to be access, right? So we got to figure out, OK, now that I've got an individual targeted, how do I actually get access to that individual so I can get malicious code onto his computer or laptop or something? Uh, so then I start thinking about, well, what ways can I access? And, and like in general, I said it's going to be either web or email nowadays, right? That's the two most popular ways in because we created these firewalls that will block everything else but allow web and email traffic in and out, you know, typically unimpeded. Uh, okay, so then I'm going to develop that particular exploit. So I'm going to develop the, the PDF uh, that I'm going to send. Dr. Shea, and then I'm going <laughs> to craft an actual piece of malicious code that will go into that PDF. All right? How do you do this? That's where it gets hard. All right? So we, I try to teach my students when they come out for the summer uh, exactly how to do this kind of thing. And we create actual malware. And it's really cool. We'll look at real malware, real live malware, and then we recreate it using our own techniques. So it could be. Uh, typically, like in Word, uh, one of the big things now is PowerShell, right? Uh, so PowerShell is being used a lot in some current attacks, right? And the PowerShell gets activated typically by a macro in a Word document. Guess what every Windows machine has on it? 
PowerShell. <laughs> Ever since Windows 7, that is default on there, right? So you can guarantee, uh, as long as they're running Windows 7 or later, uh, they're going to have a version of PowerShell on their machine. So you don't have to even convince them to install something like you would have to do with Java, because not every machine is going to have a Java runtime. All right, so then I develop this thing, I embed it in there, and then I send them an email and actually ask them to open it. Right? I said, whoa, here's the email, here's the agenda in the PDF. The, the PDF has some malicious code. He's going to open it up. It's going to take advantage of an exploit in the Adobe, and then it will find a way to the operating system. It will ask for more malware, and it will actually exploit the operating system. It will start to beacon out to my site, located somewhere, could be anywhere in the US or a foreign country. All right? And guess what that beacon looks like when I say beacon? really, really innocuous, right? It's only maybe 10, 15, 20 bytes, and it's gonna look like probably HTML, so it'll go right through that web proxy at your organization that is designed to stop malware because it's not technically looking like malware. It's deceiving the web proxy that is designed to catch malware because it's just HTML, and it's already a predefined code. Just like those yellow dots were a predefined code, this HTML will look like regular HTML, but it'll be a predefined code. When it's actually received and decoded, it will describe the machine that Dr. Shea has, the actual operating system, the antivirus, the actual patch level on it, and the IP address. <laughs> So now I have all this information and I probably, because I've specially pre-encoded all these codes, I can probably do it in less than 20 bytes. It's not gonna get caught by any of those unless I have an exact static signature and I know what to look for. Okay, so now does everyone understand what we're up against, right? This is tricky, tricky stuff. And to be good defenders, we need to be just as tricky. Okay, and then persistence is that whole beaconing thing because now I'm going to be listening. Every hour, his machine is just going to send out a little code saying, yep, still here. Okay, still here. And the minute I want his machine to do something for me, I respond back and I send another predetermined code and then his machine is running some piece of malware already that knows how to decode my little 20 bytes. Uh, response and it will say go to uh, the internal network and look for a file on nuclear weapons and it will know how to do that and it will look just like Dr. Shea is doing it uh, to the internal security monitoring folks there will be no difference because in essence he is doing it right it's taken over his identity it's using his user account his machine his IP address there is no other way to really understand because now it's happening all internal and all I sent was a 20 byte HTML response code. How hard is that to capture? Very, very hard. <laughs> That's what makes this job so much fun though. <laughs> it really is a cat and mouse game. Okay, so I don't wanna go too much depth uh, on moving target, but I did say that uh, it's kind of hard to read. It's, uh, but uh, let me just summarize that real quick. Uh, so there's basically five domains that Moving Target has been defined uh, to uh, implement. And those domains, uh, you can see all the way from the top, will be data, and then software, and then runtime environment, and then your operating system. And at the very bottom is the actual hardware, right? The memory, the processor, the network. And so in our experiment, we branched, we took the moving target domain idea and we said we're gonna use camouflage but we're gonna operate at the network uh, level, right? Network and sort of a combination between the network and the operating system level. And I'll describe that, uh, how our experiment is, is being set up. But just to give you an example, uh, say we take that middle one, the runtime environment layer, right? So what do you think that means uh, if we're using moving target? How do we dynamically create various runtimes for our systems to, to uh, run. Okay, so this is a question for the, definitely the computer scientists in the room. So think about what was happening about 15, 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, every Windows machine was being vulnerable and was uh, vulnerable to attack by using uh, these attacks, these exploits that knew the address space of every process, right? So, so every application you're 
uh, machine, whether it's Windows, Linux, Mac, runs within a process, right? That's the container that this application runs in, right? Your exe file, whatever it is, runs within a process. Every process gets what looks to be a, an entire address space, right? Say you have four gigabytes of memory on your machine, your RAM. Well, every process will get what appears to be an address space of, of four gigabytes, right? Even though it technically cannot take all four gigabytes, right? It's just like the phone company, right? Technically, your local central office has the ability to handle 10,000 callers. What happens if 10,000 callers in that central office all call at the same time? Crash. Crash. Yeah, that Unix switch, believe it or not, most, I, I think anyway, uh, Dr. Shea can probably tell me if I'm wrong, most uh, central offices are probably still implemented on Unix switches. Yeah, for many years it was uh, the AT&T 5 ESS uh, switch. And I think Dr. Shea worked on some of those in his previous life. Uh, and I bet, <laughs> and, I, and that's where he got his uh, start spear fishing me. It's like, oh, <laughs> I know I'm going to meet this Kevin guy sometime sooner or later. <laughs> So anyway, uh, so the running Unix switches, right? And if you have 10,000 callers, I'll try to call in any central office at the same time, that switch will crash, right? Nobody will get service and someone will have to be called in to reboot the machine and everything else. Okay, so the same thing operates within a computer nowadays that no one process can really be allocated all that memory, but it thinks it does have it, right? Uh, so what we had to do to thwart the attackers was to say, hey, instead of the Windows operating system, uh, Windows 7, Service Pack 1, whatever, always using these static addresses, right? And there's a certain number of processes that will always come up when you boot your machine up that are started by the operating system. Uh, they would always come up with the same uh, address. So if I'm writing an attack, I know what hexadecimal address to attack if I'm going to overflow the buffer, if I'm going to overflow the heap. Uh, so Intel worked with Microsoft in the early 2000s, and they came up with something with address space layout randomization, right? Long, long term ASLR to say, we're going to vary that every time. Every time we boot up, we're going to vary that. Every time a process comes up, it's guaranteed not to come up in the same address, same starting address. It changes. Well, guess what? It took some years to catch on, because if you're a programmer, you're not used to this. You have to be using a compiler with a switch, the Visual Studio compiler or another C compiler, and you have to turn that on, <laughs> right? And uh, if you don't turn that flag on, the default is to compile it with static addressing. So for many years, it, it, even though it was available, Intel and Microsoft worked together on it, it was still vulnerable, but now pretty much the default is it's always compiled with it on, and you have to set a flag now to turn it off, yeah. So I show my students how to do that and everything, because a lot of times we'll be running an exploit and it won't work. And I say, well, did you compile the exploit with ASLR on or off? Because sometimes the exploit was only designed to work with the static address space. All right, so that's one example of how moving target came about. So that was really the first one. Now we're doing IP address, now we're doing operating systems, now we're doing all this other stuff, but it gets harder and harder. How many years did it take for that one particular feature to be implemented? and to make it almost transparent, many years, right? We knew about that vulnerability since the 90s. Intel and Microsoft kept talking about it, but it, we knew it had to be a hardware slash software feature. It took probably over 10 years before it finally got implemented you know, into the operating system, into the processors, and into every Intel you know, uh, core i5, i3, i7 processor out there. And does ARM have it? I don't, I don't know if ARM has it or not, yeah. My guess is not. Guess what is running in your phone? An ARM processor. So my only guess, if they don't have it yet, is because the attacks on the ARM processor are so easy right now, they don't need it, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't know if anyone studied mobile malware, but it's a whole nother game. Hold on to the ball of wax. Okay, so before I run out of time, let me move on here. Okay, so talk about this experiment we're doing uh, for this customer. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're trying to create a large-scale controlled experiment on the use of deception in computer network defense, as I talked about. So this deception is going to take two forms. Uh, basically, we're going to simulate hosts to distract and confuse attackers, right? So very similar to honeypots, except there's one difference here. Instead of having them on separate machines and everything, 
they're going to be well dispersed and integrated into our regular environment, right? And I originally said honeypots, you didn't want to create these honeypots here and make them vulnerable to attackers because then they could get in and take over your entire network. Well, we're creating these simulated hosts and they're almost like these inflatable tanks, right? They're not really with any services or data, right? So if they attack them, it's easy you know, for us to thwart them because there's really nothing there and we can set a tripwire to, to let us know, oh, they're attacking a fake host and that's something wrong, right? So no one should ever be talking to this fake host. Okay, the second one is kind of cool maybe for you psychologists and social scientists in the room is psychological deception. Uh, this is where it gets tricky because we have to go to something that I had never heard of before until I worked with uh, these gosh darn psychologists and there's something called IRB. Has anyone heard of this? It's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Because in the army, all they did was medical experimentation on me, right? They injected my arms every, I mean, the first day of army boot camp, who knows what went in my arms. All I know, I went into a gymnasium on one end, came out the other end, my both arms were bleeding and I was sick for three days. <laughs> who knows, they probably gave me LSD and everything else. I don't know. <laughs> But, but for some reason now, when we conduct an experiment with human subjects, we have to go to IRB, and if we're using deception, the, the IRB uh, folks who make these decisions don't like deception. I don't know why. I was like, it's not really harmful. I mean, we're just telling them there is going to be some tools being used on this network, and this tool might be using some form of deception. Well, as soon as they hear that word for some reason, they get all nervous. And so our psychologists and cognitive scientists have been working with the IRB at the Department of Energy now for about six months, and they still haven't got it approved. So our whole experiment may have to be redesigned here because we're supposed to be conducting the first pilot next week. As a matter of fact, I had to delay it because I'm here, and so we delayed it till next week. But the first pilot where we're going to bring in some Sandian uh, staff members to act as subjects, uh, we're going to start testing. So anyway, we're going to use two things. So it's technical. Uh, deception, right? And a technical deception is going to take the form of, uh, does anyone know what uh, Linux container technology is, right? So Docker, OpenVZ, all that kind of stuff. So for the non-CS folks, it's just a way of creating a virtualized uh, uh, machine, right? It's a, it's a nice lightweight version instead of a heavy like ver uh, VMware VM. It's a nice lightweight. We're going to be using some form of Linux container technology to create these fake hosts. Uh, we're going to distribute them throughout the network. We're going to make them look like real hosts, but they will have nothing in there, okay? All right, so basically we have these two main conditions, and then we basically want to say, oh, we want to test, you know, with deception on and deception off, and whether we inform the subjects that deception is being used or not. So it generally comes out with a two-by-two two or, or four-condition experiment design plus the actual base condition. Am I, am I running out of time or...? Okay, all right, I'm speeding up now. Okay, <laughs> so I just told you about that, so I'll skip over that. Uh, okay, hypothesis. All right, defensive cyber deception tools. Impede attackers who seek to penetrate computer systems and infiltrate, or actually that should read exfiltrate information. Generally, the infiltration happens with the spear phishing. Uh, exfiltration occurs after they get in your network and they steal all your secrets, right, to your company. All right, so it should say exfiltrate information. Um, defensive deception tools are effective even if an attacker is aware of their use. That's kind of cool. So this is where it gets into that psychological thing. So what happens if we tell the subject uh, we're going to be using deception on this network and they're going to be trying to attack it. We're hiring professional penetration testers to come in and we're paying a lot of money uh, to do this. And, and what happens if we tell them deception tools are going to be uh, on there and they're not? does that alter their behavior, right? So that's where the IRB gets all nervous because they're like, oh, this may cause a lasting psychological harmful effect. I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being negative, but it really is frustrating to me as a computer scientist that these guys don't get it. Uh, so defensive deception is effective even if attackers merely believe that the tool may be in use, right? So that's kind of cool, right? We know the attackers have been using it. Why shouldn't we be using it even if we're not using it, let them think that we're using it. So maybe instead of them doing steps one, two, three, four, and five in a matter of hours or days, maybe it takes them longer and that gives us more time to catch them now, okay? 
So I think this is going to be a really cool experiment, and hopefully uh, if we have a workshop next year or whatever, I can give you all the results of it, right? Because we should be done by the end of this year. Uh, so anyway, some of the cognitive and psychological secondary objectives we hope to gain is uh, measure variability in individual performance, right? We're going to be spending like a million dollars to hire these penetration testers. Uh, and uh, we want to get as much as we can, right? So we want to see, we're going to probably get a good spectrum of uh, skills, right? And they're, they're acting as proxies for real hackers, right? And I understand they're not real hackers. They're going to be generally U.S. citizens, right, who have been trained, you know, and work in the industry. But at least it's the closest thing we can get without, you know, hiring illegal hackers. Uh, so we're going to give them some cognitive tests to explore links to any, uh, do, does everyone know what CTF is? In, in uh, my world? Yeah, I know, like we're talking different languages, right? <laughs> so, so CTF, I know Shard knows. So capture the flag, right? So like DEF CON and so on. And that's what got me really excited about you know, doing all this stuff and working with students because I saw how much fun it was to compete in these competitive events where we try to hack each other, try to solve puzzles, right? And everyone, every human I know of is so competitive, they all want to be smarter than the next guy, right? So that's what drives these CTFs. And we want to see if actually hiring someone with a lot of CTF experience actually helps them become a better cyber defender. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, they're going to do some personality questionnaires. And one of the things that I picked up just uh, earlier, the Hofstede uh, kind of idea, I'm wondering if we can't pick up uh, some cues to the organizational culture that they come from and see if that has an effect. Because some of these guys are going to be coming from well-known, big, high-paying companies like FireEye. Uh, CrowdStrike. Some of them will be coming from maybe mom and pop companies, you know, that we hire, and they won't have all, all that experience and access to other skilled people. And we want to see if those organizational, uh, organizational environments have different cultures and if that affects the performance of these, uh, of these hackers. Uh, identify potential improvements to the tools that we're being given by the customer to run deception. All right? And we want to, like we said, the, the, the you could do so much, right, with deception, uh, like the attackers do, but the problem is maintenance, right? Who's going to own it? Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to continue to operate it? You have to make it as simple as easy, and that's the approach we're using right now with our uh, current technology. And so let me skip over this. We're going to, like I said, we're going to be hiring over 100 of these professional pen testers. That's why it's costing us so much money. And get, get this, for any student in the room who's looking at potentially uh, a job in the near future, uh, FireEye was telling us they want $900 an hour to provide us a penetration tester. 900 an hour. Yeah. I'm in the... Can you be a psychologist? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you can hack, I bet they will be happy to pay you. <laughs> I usually, I'm just guessing, but I'm just guessing, usual contractors, it's like a 50-50 split. Yeah, so just figure uh, about a half. It might be a little less, but in general, it's about 50-50 split between the contractor and the actual individual. Yeah, good money, huh? Okay, so um, this goes into some of the details that we're going to be doing uh, for generating these deceptive hosts, right? So basically, we're populating this. Say you have an, a network within your company, and the address space of what's called a Class C network is generally 255 hosts, right? That's a fairly small subnet, right? But what if you had a small company? You only had, you know, say 50 machines. Well, you have 200 possible IP addresses that are not being used. We will fill all that up with decoy hosts, right? So that's the idea. We just randomly disperse, and we don't have to fill them all up, but in our experiment, we said we're just going to fill them all up to make it look like it's much more populated than it really is, right? So this hopefully will distract the attacker from the real assets and increase the amount of confusion or uncertainty, right, or possibly incorrect belief of what the infrastructure really looks like. So hopefully what we're hoping to do is force the attacker to take additional actions, slowing them down, giving us the ability to detect uh, that they're there, right? And so hopefully uh, we'll be able to be much more proactive. Okay, I think I'm coming up to my last slide here. Okay, I wanted to talk about this for just a minute. So there was a prior study before they came to us, and it was a very low scale, uh, low budget one. Uh, but they realized there was potential in doing this, and then they came to us uh, with a bit more money. But they basically only had three red team subjects, right? We're going to have well over 100. 
they, they set up uh, similar conditions that we're setting up. They found when deception was present, uh, but they were not aware, so we're, uh, this group, they were not told that deception was being used, uh, subjects spent 30% of the time on deceptive assets. Right? That's pretty good, uh, considering they only constituted 90% of the address space. So that example I gave you with 255, uh, it was only about 50 fake hosts, but they spent over a third of their time investigating the wrong host. Right? So that gives us a leg up now. Okay, not bad for a pretty low cost uh, solution. All right, when it was present and they were aware deception was being used, the subject scanned and attacked more slowly and cautiously. So I thought that was good. That was proving what we want them to do, is they're taking much more time to investigate uh, their target network. And the subjects were especially leery of the most vulnerable or valuable hosts, right? So if something looked a little weird on the network, they were automatically very leery of it, thinking that's got to be a fake one, right? Well, what if it happened to be one employee is running an application on a Windows XP Service Pack 2 machine, right? And he has to have it. He's already been to the CIO. He said, nope, this application uh, will cost a million dollars to be rewritten in you know, the latest software, so we have to run this XP. Well, if I'm one of those guys, I'm thinking, oh, this XP is obviously a decoy. Nobody's be running XP nowadays. Guess how many people run XP? A lot of people, <laughs> believe it or not. And that is, that's the death knell, right? Uh, XP is so vulnerable. But anyway, uh, they were very leery and they admitted that they did some post uh, exercise uh, interviews and found out, well, what were your thoughts? And that's what we're going to do too. Uh, so I think that captures the main salient points here. Uh, and just some of the things we're going to be, so we're going to be setting up flags. So it's very similar to capture the flag. And what, what's a flag? Does anyone have an idea? Any? What a flag could be? Yeah, could be anything. Yeah, so anything that we plant. Remember I talked about that original like blue dye operation? So think of the flag being like a blue dye, right? Something I intentionally plant, right? And I could make it look very valuable, like secrets of the B-61 nuclear weapon system, right? Or I could just make it look fairly innocuous, like someone's pay stub, right? But uh, whatever we put in there, we're going to intentionally know what the flag is. And they're going to just be essentially told, go in and find something that you think is valuable. And they're going to have to submit it to one of the white cell members, and then we will grade them, right? We won't tell them during the exercise until it's over, right? So they won't know. Nor during a normal capture of the flag, you would know right away. You submit it, and you, and you would get scored, right? You either get zero if it's not a real flag, or you would get you know, whatever the point score is. And that's how the capture of the flags work. Generally, you're looking for something that is supposed to be valuable right, to the victim and you're, you're going to be stealing it. Okay, we're also going to be monitoring some of their, uh, uh, what's it, physiological, I guess. Uh, like, uh, we're going to be having them wear Fitbits. Uh, we're going to be, I think uh, Rob is hoping to do GSR uh, uh, Gal Galvanic. Yeah, that's it. I, yeah, they use all these terms, and I don't, you know, they don't fit into my vernacular. <laughs> so then I throw my terms out. <laughs> <laughs> and my, when I go home and talk about this, my wife just goes, jibber, 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 jibber. <laughs> she, yeah, she, she doesn't put up with it very much. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, so data that we're not going to collect, uh, we were going to do like all network capture uh, in and amongst all those hosts. We realized it would generate so much data uh, that no one would have time to analyze. So we're only going to capture data coming from the actual subject's machine, and we're going to provide them a machine so we know that they have to consent to monitoring. Uh, if they want to talk to, it won't be connected to the internet. If they want to talk to the internet, they'll have their cell phone. And because you cannot be a, a red team or penetration tester without an internet connection, because everything you do, you, you know, you just can't possibly know every feature of every piece of software and every operating system out there or remember it. So you rely on your intuition, and then when you hit something you don't know, you look it up on the internet. It's like, okay, what port does this particular service run on by default? And what's, uh, you know, a good one is, what's the default password for like a Cisco switch, right? Many Netgear switches, especially for home use, are never reconfigured, and they're given like a password, a password, or 1111, and we saw that on someone's slide earlier today, right? And so those are the things that's really handy when, when you're, you know, you come upon that, you just do an internet search, and within 30 seconds, you possibly are in, right? Okay, so I think that is 
All right, talked about human subjects, cognitive batteries we're going to do, questionnaires, and capture the flag. There's the network, I'm going to go into that. Uh, and then the whole configuration. And there's our timeline, okay. So basically, we're finishing up the range right now, and that big fancy network diagram was something I created over the last uh, five months, and it's gonna be able to run a thousand virtual machines, all concurrently, run Zen server. And we built a pool of uh, six uh, high-end servers, so we're, we've got like uh, two and a half terabytes of physical memory. We're gonna be running all these virtual machines, and we've got 43 terabytes on our file storage uh, system, and that's going to be hosting all the virtual disks for them. And so we have a huge plethora of potential data that the analysts can look at, but we're not going to get paid for that, and we're not going to have time, so we have to narrow it down. So technically, I could keep every single virtual disk from every single subject, but can you imagine who has time to look through 40 terabytes you know, for that one? So no, no we're going to have to, excuse me? Oh, grad students, I know. That's exactly why we bring them in the summer. <laughs> yep. So I'm going to randomly capture some of them, and then next summer uh, we'll see if we missed anything, right? So we're going to have a lot of automated metric stuff, right, to determine what, they're, what they did and didn't do. But hopefully by the end of December we will have that analyzed. And like I said, uh, they want us, our customer does, they, they, I have to respect their sensitivities right now. They don't want to uh, publicize who they are. But by next year, then they want us to publish papers on it and everything. So I think it'll be very interesting to see what we find out. And we hope to continue because we think this is a good blend of how to advance the cyber defense technology and also look at the actual psychological and cognitive science aspects, right? To see, okay, well, what does work? What is more effective, right? Uh, obviously, like I said, we're using proxies for the attackers, but hopefully that, that will transfer somewhat and give us some insight. Okay, so that's all I have. Any questions? You have one. <laughs> uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. My You're welcome. My is on your ethics board. I've served on a oh. few. They sound incredibly conservative. Oh, my God, they are. <laughs> I, I have argued this, right? And that was one of the reasons I wanted to have a visible scoreboard, just like a real capture the flag, because I see, and I've been doing this for like uh, six, seven years now, creating my own capture the flag contest for students and professionals, and I see how motivated they get when they can watch that screen and see they're doing better than the team next to them. And, but the customer didn't want us to public or, or make it visible to them, you know? And, and I argued, I said, it's going to definitely degrade the motivation factor. And she was saying that, well, you know, they should be motivated and everything. I said, well, yeah, but that's not how it works, right? That's, it, it really need that immediate feedback. Because if they're not told that, oh, this is really what is valuable and what isn't, then they're just going to say, oh, I'll just get whatever, you know? So yeah, so it's still a question. It hasn't been determined by the IRB yet. I was thinking about that, and so we're looking at different things, like uh, maybe just little inexpensive Starbucks cards or gift cards, stuff like that. So we're trying to get that approved by the IRB. So uh, I really would love to communicate with you further if you had hints on this IRB. It's like, oh my God, I'm so glad I'm not the guys going in and having to negotiate with the folks, but uh, yeah, I, I feel their pain for sure. <laughs> yes? So Kevin, I love this discussion. <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. Displace on personal kind of antidotes, right? Right, right. So my, 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 my hypothesis is that most of the research and the money spent by government agencies is on looking at institutional networks. Mm -hmm. So yep, attack yep. a network, defend the network, yep, yep. modify the network. Absolutely. And yet when I read, working with the Cyber Institute, I'm working with the reports from Verizon annually. Yeah. Martin, yep, the yep, yep, yep. Okay. <laughs> I'm not dealing with that. Okay. But, okay, so I, by default, turn over most of my protection to a bunch of folks that are, I have no idea. Right, yeah, you never see, you never talk to, yeah. yeah.
teach the normal people that kind no. of stuff. No. So, for example, you mentioned the phrase, overflow the heat. Yep, yep. How many of you understand that phrase, overflow the heat? Okay. Not so many. Okay, I yeah. I can get up once. Yeah, I yeah. Remember. No, it's, 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 it's an important thing. It is very important, yeah. I had a colonel come to me and said, uh, Lieutenant Nauer, show me the ports, right? So I, just as a joke, I showed him the serial port on the back. He goes, really? That's only one? I go, no, I'm just kidding, sir. <laughs> he goes, OK, Sergeant Nauer. <laughs> Yep, I know. And so I look at, well, what's personally a problem for me? Well, I got a bank account, I got credit card accounts. I happen to have a broker account, which was more. Nobody's going to fill it up, but they might steal it, right? Yep, absolutely. There's no way of knowing if anything I do you don't. is going to violate that. You don't. And that seems to be a bigger problem than we, we pay enough certain or our attention to. And yes. I don't know how we're doing. You. you you are definitely preaching to the choir here because I have made this argument, and for many years we've always blamed the victim, you know, this whole uh, blame the victim culture. And we say, well, only if the you know, end user could be smarter or not click on that. But they have gotten so sophisticated and so good that, you know, at some point I know I'm going to be, you know, subject to it as well, and I uh, only because I'm just so, <laughs> you know, skeptical of everything. Uh, but uh, there is, there, there really isn't uh, a way of educating the the user to the point where they could possibly understand all this. And and I don't know what the answer is. Is yeah. How many of you are OPM victims? Oh yeah, right here, right here, yeah. Yep. Yep. I get lucky and not a fingerprint stolen guy. But then once you do that, then you have the opportunity to sign up with the government for three years of protection, and you can protect as much as you want. But what it means is you enter all your account numbers, yep. all your personal data, all that stuff, and hand it over to some place out in the cloud. And I'm thinking, not a month after I did that, that was kind of stupid. Yeah, yeah, and you're just giving them more information. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? And I. I so the government solution says, yeah. Yep. Yep. Who's researching that aspect so that we make the customer because you know the, the product provider so it's normal for the whole Yep. Yep. You're you're just simply a user, right? And yeah, there's no way you could possibly know everything that that application's doing. Yeah, yeah, no. No, I was very, when I got that letter from the OPM saying, oh, you can then sign up for this, you know, free credit monitoring. I was like, no, I was like, you already lost all my information and uh, I'm, I'm not putting it out there again, you know, and I'll be coming up for my five year review here later this year. And I guarantee I'm going to have to put in everything from the very beginning for the past 30 years. And I'm going to figure out a nice name like Mr. Smith. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'm, I'm so leery of, of doing that because I saw what happened. You know, we can't protect it. Yeah. No, very good point. Thank you. I see anything else? All right. Thank you very much.